Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum to everyone who might be tuning in to listen to this and hello also. I did not manage to do a recording for day three of Muharram, so this is day four of Muharram. And today I am going to be reflecting upon what divides communities across the world, particularly obviously our communities and one of the factors that does drive our communities apart is misinformation, misunderstandings and assumptions that are made about different people. This can cause division and wounds that can often never be healed. When we go back to the components that led to the martyrdom of Imam Hussein salam, we can see that right after the death of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his purified progeny, that misinformation and the twisting of facts and the twisting of the truth persuaded people that Imam Ali salam should not be the successor to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. So we can see that the reworking of information is what persuaded people to give their backing to a caliphate that has no Quranic basis. We can see that this disinformation as well, or reworking of information, uh, and sometimes even outright smear campaigns against the Ahlul Bayt salam, and especially as we know Imam Ali salam, two parties, one in Mecca, one in Syria, that led vehement smear campaigns against Imam Ali salam, to justify their wars against him. The wars against Imam Ali salam, that called for justice for the martyrdom of the third caliph Uthman this was a, just a pretext for the actual real reason behind wanting to prevent Imam Ali salam from coming to power as caliph. And we could say that this is what encapsulates history. Often what we hear is a variation of the truth. And the reason that we've been told that variation of the truth is for covert reasons, for hidden reasons that are not always easily detectable. So this misinformation about the Ahlul Bayt salam, and an outright smear campaigns are what persuaded many people to give their backing to Ma'awiyah in Damascus um, and what diminished those who were uh, able to follow behind Imam Hassan salam, and also Imam Hussein salam. So this fact, this issue of deliberately spreading misinformation in a very calculated fashion to, in a sense, manufacture consent for an attack on a particular person, of course, if, if we know the truth about a person, we won't go ahead and attack them. If they're a good person, and we know that they're a good person, then if someone says, well, you know, I've got covert reasons for wanting to attack them. I, I, I'm jealous, I'm envious of them. I want to try and blackmail them or get money out of them. We would not be persuaded to attack somebody. But if we've been told lies about somebody, and if not only just us, but let's say a whole community has been told lies about a particular person, then of course everybody is going to be in some kind of agreement that this person who has been lied about is a terrible person and they deserve to be attacked. This is going on in our communities at quite an alarming rate and there are more and more cases arising particularly when it comes to marriage. We see that there are many fake marriages happening in the communities 
around the world where someone will make the pretense of being sincere uh, and get married to someone for a passport or citizenship um, and of course for the financial benefits that they may ultimately cash in on at the end of that marriage and they wait it out for quite a number of years just as certain personalities waited it out um, ready to strike against Imam Ali alayhi salam. People who are coming into the communities in different parts of the world with the aim of getting citizenship or a passport or financial benefits and children as well are doing so in a way that conceals their intentions. Once they decide to discard the person that they utilised in order to get those benefits, of course it doesn't look good for them to publicly discard such a person. So what they must do first is to launch a smear campaign against them. They must manufacture consent in their communities in order to justify an attack on that person. There are so many cases of this going on in our communities that this is why I'm, I'm bringing it up because the pattern that one sees is that you will hear something about somebody. What a terrible person they were. Did you realize X, Y, Z for many years they were doing X, Y, Z. And what happens is that nobody goes to that person and verifies the facts with them. What they will do is they'll go and tell someone else. And this innocent person who is having a smear campaign organised against them, often not even aware about what's being said about them behind their backs, will find themselves being isolated from that community and put in a very vulnerable situation. And by the time that the spouse wants to discard that person, everybody thinks that they are terrible the target, they think they're a terrible person and then that spouse who got married for certain material gains um, has everybody on their side, full backing, support and, um, and even will attack the target on behalf of the person who's organising the smear campaign. So this is not unlike on a different level, what happened to the Ahlul Bayt? This is going on um, among our own communities, that people are listening to reports and believing it wholeheartedly, especially when it's told maybe in a dramatic fashion, you know, with, with some kind of feeling in the way that it's being told and it convinces people, oh yeah, you know, this is, this is true, I better go and tell so-and-so and then it'll get around the whole community. This is essentially allowing one person with covert motives, self-interested motives, to destroy a whole community, to destroy a whole family, to cause misery in the target's friends, the target's family members, and to cause the gradual breakdown of a family for generations. So, this is not the only way that smear campaigns are conducted. Many people conduct smear campaigns out of hasad, out of jealousy, out of some sense that they are going to gain power uh, by slandering someone else and, and by the need, personal need, to feel some kind of sense of power. They claim to know things about someone that nobody else knows when actually it's all manufactured, it's all fabricated. And they can be very convincing for many, many years. So this is a small warning and reflection to myself, to everybody, that if we want to hold our communities together, if we want to stand by justice, then we must be very careful about what we hear, be very careful about what we pass on, be much more alert to 
certain behaviours among people that are helping to destroy someone and try to destroy their lives. And we need to communicate. We need to open up channels of communication. If you've heard something negative about someone, but you don't really know who they are, instead of carrying that around in your mind as a fact, open up communication with that person. Enter a dialogue. Verify for yourself whether it is the truth. Because this is what has happened to Islam right back to the earliest days that the truth got lost. People didn't know what was the truth because they had been diverted by lies and fabrications. And of course, people don't get diverted unless those lies and fabrications sound very convincing. So we need to be careful before we automatically hear something from someone and, and take it on board. We need to have caution against where this report may have come from, who made it up in the first place, why, and whether we actually know the person that that report is about. So these are just some of my reflections for tonight and maybe some thoughts on how we can strengthen the bonds in our communities and be aware of being misled and deceived. Thank you for listening. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.